Good morning, all you Suhai Earth Science students. Yes, rise and shine again. It's a beautiful, frigid, minus 14 degree morning. So let's get your notes out and something to write with and start warming this thing up. Today we're beginning our next topic, groundwater and groundwater systems. Something we take for granted every time we turn on the faucet for a drink or the shower to smell better. So, let's get started. First, let's get some important facts about fresh water into your notes so we have a place to start. Write that only 3% of the Earth's water is fresh and potable. Now, write in your notes that potable, P-O-T-A-B-L-E, means that it can actually be consumed and used for cooking. Also write that although groundwater is only 0.6% of the Earth's water, that that 0.6 represents 14% of the fresh water. So groundwater is only 0.6 of the 3%, but it's 14% of the Earth's fresh water. Also get in your notes that excluding glaciers, groundwater is 94% of the available fresh water. Next, let's look at how we use groundwater. Write in your notes that groundwater is used for three main things. Number one, it's used as drinking water for about 50% of the population. Number two, it accounts for about 40% of the irrigation water, the water that's used to, to water crops. And number three, it provides 25% of industry's needs. So, 50% of the population uses it as drinking water, 40% of it's used for irrigation water, and 25% of the, of the groundwater is used for industry needs. Next, let's talk about an often used term and try and understand it. Write that the water table is the top of the subsurface zone, subsurface means below, okay? So we're looking at the water table right here. That's this line right here in this diagram. Okay. Is the top of the subsurface zone in which all rock openings are filled with water. And this is called the saturated zone. All right, the saturated zone. So that's this. Saturated means it can't hold any more water. So when you have all of this rock, and water's filled the cracks in and it can't hold anymore. It's called the saturated zone. So make sure you get that in your notes. And then right at the top of the saturated zone is this thing called the water table. So make sure you differentiate between the saturated zone and the water table. Now, the water level at the surface of most lakes and rivers corresponds to the local water table. That's very important. So the water level at the surface of our lakes in this area and the rivers in this area corresponds to what we call the local water table. Also write that above the water table is an unsaturated zone. You see that right here. An unsaturated region called the Vados zone. That's not on this diagram. V-A-D-O-S-E. The Vados zone that you can also see in this diagram. I don't know why they don't have it uh, labeled, but this area right here of unsaturated uh, rock and soil is called the Vados zone, V-A-D-O-S-E. And you can see some pictures of the water table here in this um, area. So these little ponds that are sitting here are sitting right at the water table in this local area. Okay, next get in your notes that a perched water table, you see a couple of examples of perched water tables. So a perched water table is a water table with a bunch of perch in it. <laughs> no, not really. A perched water table is one that's above and separated from the main water table by an unsaturated rock layer. And that perch water tables 
are commonly produced by thin layers of impermeable rock. For example, shales or clays. So you see this rock right here underneath both of these. That, that would be a shale or a clay, which is really tight. Doesn't have a lot of space in between them. So it's kind of like a, its own mini water table, a perch table is. Also write that permeable means water can seep through the cracks in the rock well, impermeable means that water can't seep through it. So, in terms of permeable and impermeable, shale would be an impermeable rock, so it would hold this water. Clay would be another example of, so of a soil that would be relatively impermeable. So, perched water tables. These are their own little mini water tables. And lots of times, you can see here, if there's enough water in these perched wells or perched water tables, we can sink wells down there and use the water. So, you got to be able to tell the difference between a normal water table, which is right here, and a perched water table, which are these little pockets now that have their own water supply. Okay, now write in your notes that water infiltrates like water through a filter. So, if you were to take a coffee filter and pour water into the coffee or in the coffee filter in the basket like in a coffee maker that water infiltrates or filters through that um, filter the same thing happens now with soil and rock now water infiltrates through a filter in in what are called recharge areas like you see in the, in this diagram a recharge area so here's a couple of recharge areas right here. So you can see now that water now can drain through this rock. It can also drain down this rock. But it can drain through this soil and rock. And what that does is recharge the water table. So this is called the recharge zone. Also get in your notes that groundwater recharge is also referred to as deep drainage or deep percolation. Now there's another coffee uh, reference. Percolation. P-E-R-C-O-L-A-T-I-O-N. Percolation. So a, a percolator coffee pot has a basket in it and the basket has, a, has a holes in it. A little metal basket. You pour the coffee in it and the water pumps now through the coffee and that's called now percolation. So the water or the water drains through the coffee grains, and that's how coffee's made. Same thing happens in a in a drip coffee maker, where you put um, a piece of filter in it, uh, or you put a filter paper in it, then you pour the coffee in the filter paper, and then the water filters the coffee through the filter paper. That's called percolation. It's also called infiltration. Now. That's a hydrologic process, hydrologic means water, where water moves downward, which changes it from surface water. So this water right here is surface water. And it changes it from surface water to groundwater. So you need to know the difference between surface water and groundwater and how surface water becomes groundwater. So it becomes groundwater by recharging or percolating through or draining down through the rock back into the groundwater. Okay, this process is often expressed as flux. So write that in your notes. This process of water percolating through the soil is referred to as flux. Now, recharge occurs in two ways we want you to get in your notes. First, recharge can occur naturally through the water cycle. You see a picture of the water cycle right here. However, it can also occur through what is called artificial groundwater recharge, where rainwater and or reclaimed water, we'll see an example of reclaimed here in a bit, where rainwater or reclaimed water is allowed to reach down into the subsurface. Now, a typical example of that um, we'll talk about here in a second. But a surface example of reclaiming water 
would be um, water that drains out of the gutters and downspouts into a big barrel. You're reclaiming that water. Now, it's not going into the groundwater, but you understand the idea of reclaiming the water. So now what we're going to talk about is how do we artificially uh, replace or reclaim the groundwater. Now, if you take a look at this diagram, we can see an example of both types of recharge at work here. You see the natural recharge from precipitation on the left. So over here on the left, we see natural. So you got the storm cloud up here, here's our rain, rains on the surface. Some of it runs off into rivers and streams, but some of it then recharges the water table by percolating through the sand, sand and gravel, into this groundwater reservoir. Here's our, our uh, uh, water table right here, the top of this saturated zone. So this is the natural way it happens. Um, we're about, hopefully soon, we're about to get um, an example of natural um, recharge when the snow starts to melt. Some of it will run off into lakes and streams, but some of it, once the frost leaves, will also penetrate this layer and recharge our groundwater. Okay, now, however, on the right you see what's called a water reclamation. So over here is a water reclamation, where water that's being used for some purpose, like maybe fracking natural gas. Um, fracking natural gas is where they find a pocket of natural gas in the, um, <clears throat> in the rock, and they shoot water into it, and that forces the natural gas out of that pocket. Then they actually capture it and use it to uh, heat homes. Well, in this case, um, this pipe now, that water that's being used, that fracking water, is now piped down back into the groundwater reserve or reservoir. So instead of sitting on the surface, they pipe it back down through this pipe and inject it, it's got little holes in it right here, and inject it back into the groundwater. That's artificial recharge. And this thing is called an artificial recharge well. So this is naturally occurring. This is artificially or man-made recharge. So it should now be relatively obvious that groundwater occurs everywhere because the ground occurs everywhere. Now there's places where it wouldn't, big cities, you know, where there's, there's pavement. Uh, there's not a lot of ground there to penetrate. So that water runs off into the sewers and then that's a whole different ball of wax. Now let's take a closer look underground and identify some key areas that help function in the production of groundwater and get them in your notes. Now, first write the zone of saturation. That's down here. Here's your zone of saturation. Now this is an area where all the pore space or space between the rock is filled with water. But not all the ground, all the ground is saturated. The next is the zone of aeration. So, and here's our water table in here too. That should be should be kind of getting an idea that the top of that zone of aeration is the water, or zone of saturation is the water table. The zone of aeration is where these pores are filled with air and water. Not just water, air and water in the zone of aeration. And then the next area we call the water table, and you understand that that's the top of the zone of saturation. And in a local area, that's where your um, rivers and lake levels are is this zone of saturation. Okay, that's it for part one of our discussion of groundwater. So take a picture of those notes, um, send them to me in Moodle, then grab that study guide, answer those questions, and I will see you back here in part two of our discussion of groundwater and groundwater systems. Bye.